Okay, I am showing 1202 on my clock right now. So I want to honor the time of all of you who've joined us so far on time. Thank you. Great work. Um, just welcome to all of you. We are going to um, spend about an hour together today during the lunch hour. We're really happy to have you here with us. I'm going to start by introducing ourselves and uh, also just sort of giving some um, hints for how to have a good webinar today. So um, just to start out with, uh, Christine and I will introduce ourselves uh, and then we have some other folks to introduce as well. Um, but as you're joining, I see that some of you have your cameras on and some of you have your cameras off and both of those are just fine. So whatever works for you today. And um, if you are eating your lunch and you wanna have your camera on, that's just fine too. It might make the rest of us hungry, but that will be all right. So we want you to just be comfortable and um, enjoy your time together over the lunch hour. Um, we'd ask that you stay muted. Uh, we expect, we already have 25 people with us right now. We expect it'll be more than that uh, by the time we get moving. So if everyone can keep themselves muted, that would be great. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So I will start off by introducing myself. Um, my name is Tricia Lubach. I am the Director of Leadership at WASDA, which if you don't know, is the Washington School Directors, um, Washington State School Directors Association. It's a mouthful even for me. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let Christine, my colleague, introduce herself now too. Yeah, it's great to be here. Hope you guys are having a good uh, day back to work. My name is Christine Naharo. I'm the coordinator for our leadership development branch within WASDA. And we're, we are very excited that you're here. Um, we're here to serve you and uh, we're glad to get to know you. Thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. Christine and I handle all of the um, resources, guidance, training, research and support that WASDA provides to school directors across the state and um, have both been with WASDA for some time. In addition to that, I've served 18 years as a school board member myself. So for all of you who are um, new to this, trust me, I know how you feel. It's daunting. Um, you might be wondering what you've gotten yourself into while also being really excited. So all of those feelings are okay. Um, we uh, know where you're coming from. So um, uh, further on in the program, we're going to have a panel with uh, Sandy Hayes, WASDA's president, and Derek Sarley, WASDA's president-elect, and we will let them introduce themselves then. They have a lot of uh, wisdom and uh, hard-earned experience to share with us. So we will um, we'll pop, we'll pop in and get started with that too. So with, it, with that, we're going to get started. Um, as we go along, uh, just a couple things. Uh, we, I would, it will go best if you um, pop questions that you have into the chat box. And then we'll keep an eye on those as we go through. At the end, we have a good portion of time assigned just for some Q&A. Um, but just to keep us moving, as you think of a question, pop it into the, the uh, chat box and we'll cover that as we go along. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Christine will also be dropping some links into the chat box for you. So for example, she's gonna drop a PDF of this PowerPoint, both at the beginning and at the end of our time, um, as well as some links that I'll refer to as we move along. So I'm gonna get us started so that we can get through the uh, program that we have for you all. We're gonna start off with just, you know, what is a collaborative team? So, you know, today's webinar is really focused on the power of a collaborative team. What does that mean? You know, those are some, those are some uh, loaded words. So what do we mean when we talk about that? A few characteristics of a team, which probably many of you know because you are likely uh, a part of many teams, is that teams often will have established norms and operating agreements of how they're going to work together and work individually. Um, they'll share and work towards common goals. That obviously is ideal if a team is doing that. Another characteristic is, is recognizing value in varied viewpoints. So there's a lot of value to having different people with different viewpoints on a team, but also recognizing that there's, you know, there's, there's value and, and it can be challenging at times to um, make sure that you're listening and thinking through that respectfully, which brings us to number four, which is interacting respectfully, even when you are disagreeing. And then finally, working collaboratively um, to achieve more than you might um, achieve on your own. 
So how does that compare, for example, with um, characteristics of just a group of individuals? So sometimes you'll have a group of individuals, but it would be difficult to call them a team. And so some of those characteristics would be things like no shared norms or expectations. The individuals are really working towards their own goals that they've identified and not necessarily working towards goals of the team that the team has agreed on. Um, operating from, that should say personal, not persona, um, operating from a personal or an individual viewpoint. So I'm not really interested in your viewpoint because I have my own and mine is the one that counts. Uh, also, no shared agreement um, for how to treat or be treated with respect to navigating disagreement. That's, you know, that lack of respectfulness and, and um, listening to uh, other perspectives and viewpoints. And then also just working individually um, to achieve more. So they're, you're working as individuals rather than really working as a team. So probably those sound familiar to some of you. I'm sure some of you have um, operated in both uh, realms. Uh, there are a couple of, I think, sort of some, some interesting um, graphics that go along with this, some visuals. Um, and there, there's a lot of language that goes with um, when a team is not working together. So lots of metaphors for what you're seeing on your screen right now. Um, you know, we're pulling apart, we're headed in different directions, we're rowing in opposite directions, we're pushing against each other. I think what's, what's uh, kind of striking about these graphics is that what you'll see here is that all of these people who are working in opposite directions from each other, there's one thing they have in common, and that's that none of them are getting anywhere. There's no movement. There's no forward movement. Um, when people are working against each other, all progress stops. And that's very true of a board um, and a board superintendent team. Um, on the other hand, if you have people who are working together, um, you can see that they're, again, kind of the same sort of metaphors that you get. Um, you know, we're all pulling in the same direction. We're putting the puzzle piece, pieces together. We're all rowing in the same direction. We're rowing together. Those are great metaphors for work that moves people forward, moves organizations forward. So as you think about your work with the board, remember that if you're not operating as a team and trying to work in the same direction, um, that you're not going to move forward. One thing I'd like to note here, um, it doesn't mean you're all doing or thinking exactly the same thing. So in the visual here where you've got one person pushing on the stone and the other person pulling on the stone, they are coming at those goals in different ways, but they're still moving in the same direction. The same could be said for the puzzle pieces. Everybody brings a little bit something different to the table, but if you can put those pieces together, that's how you'll um, really find some synergy um, as a team. So what is the role of the board and what is what does all of this um, have to do with uh, teamwork and um, how it works? Some of you might have attended board boot camp. I hope some of you did. That's a good way to get started. Uh, but you may have seen this graphic if you did. So uh, as, as they talked about there, the board really operates at a strategic level, that board level. They determine you know, what it is that, we, that you're um, aiming for. And then the next gear is at the tactical level with the superintendent who determines how the what that the school board determines is going to be accomplished. And then the last gear is that operational level, which is the staff. And the staff takes what the board has determined, determined and how the superintendent uh, plans to accomplish that. And then they execute it. They, they um, execute the how. So you can imagine you can see the arrows here. If one of those um, gears is moving in the wrong direction, it's going to stop the whole machine. And that is actually what happens uh, with a team at in a school board level. Uh, if, if the gears are out of whack or moving in opposite directions, everybody just stops. So the real challenge, of course, here is um, that only the board can align its own gears. There isn't anybody else who can do that for you. So for the five of you, or um, in the case of our largest school district, Seattle, seven board members, um, it's, it's only the board that can work together to align its gears. So that's really special work that needs to be done. Okay, so those are some big picture things in terms of looking at what are collaborative teams, how do they work together, why are, there, are they important? But we have some more specific information around school board teams that we've learned from research about how boards can um, lead their uh, districts uh, in terms of student success. 
So we've spent uh, a couple of decades at WASDA looking at research, others' research, and then some uh, some research that, that uh, WASDA has um, led themselves. And uh, we've learned a lot about what effective boards look like over time. And way back in the 90s, late 90s, um, early 2000s, uh, one of the biggest pieces of work around this was from the Iowa Association of School Boards, and it was called the Lighthouse Studies. And it really looked at what are boards doing? How are they working together or not? Uh, what are their actions? What are their beliefs? And is there any connection between that and how students are doing? And they measured that by looking at student assessments, uh, student achievement, um, academic assessments. And what they learned, and this was really the first time that this had been shown through research, was that boards of high-performing districts, high-performing means students are, um, are uh, doing well academically, boards of high-performing districts behave differently than boards of low-performing districts. And this, as you can imagine, was pretty interesting because the question was why? What is it that they're doing? What are those boards that are governing high performing districts doing um, compared to those who are, are low achieving? The, um, added to this research was some additional research by some researchers called Lee and Edens. Um, this was you know, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and they went to hundreds, if not thousands of school board meetings, which sounds like quite a task to do. And they went with a checklist um, of a variety of different actions that they could quantify while watching the board meeting and uh, listing those behaviors that they saw. And um, you know, with, with these hundreds of different examples, um, they were able to come away with, uh, with, with this understanding of there are some things that specifically low performing districts um, are doing at their board meetings that they saw over and over again. And what they saw is that those districts that have low levels of student achievement, their board meetings are less orderly. They're really not spending time talking about how their students are doing in the district, not listening respectfully or attentively advancing their own agenda, individuals are, so that gets back to the to the me, this is me versus we, um, not having good working relationships overall with their governance team, lots of, uh, lots of failure to look towards the superintendent for advice and input, and then a member, board member other than the board chair or board president uh, talking excessively in the meeting time and less focus on policy items. And so you can see that out of all of those items, um, the vast majority of, majority of them, six out of eight, are really those items that are focused on relationships and how that team is working together or not working together. So that shows the importance of, of the board team. So those were some really interesting, um, just a, a brief look at some of the research that we uh, have seen uh, in Washington State. And it's intriguing because it makes you want to know more. Why? Why is that the case? And if we know what boards who are governing um, districts with low student achievement are doing, we certainly want to look at what are those boards doing that are really supporting great success for their students. So one of the uh, items that uh, Christine's going to drop in the chat for you, if she hasn't already, is the Washington School Board Standards. And uh, this is work that, uh, again, started uh, quite some time ago, um, and it has it really identifies the five core principles of effective school boards. Um, you'll get a link to that so that you can click on that and um, look through it all. It, it contains five standard areas that describe uh, effective uh, school board governance. And then within each of those standards, uh, there's a benchmark and then there are separate indicators within each of them. It, if you went to board boot camp, you certainly got a copy of this. Um, if you didn't go to board boot camp, uh, you'll be able to grab the PDF uh, right now and see what that looks like. So as we look at measuring board behavior in Washington state, we really start with the board standards. There's also a board self-assessment survey, which is essentially a survey of how closely 
does your board adhere to these principles um, in the school board standards? So there's a self-assessment survey that's available to all school, school boards in the state at no charge. It's one of the benefits of being a WASDA member. And so we can take a look at those um, on a large scale and compare them to uh, student achievement data. So for example, we will look at boards that um, have high levels of student achievement, looking at the state achievement data. And then we can look at board self-assessments and look at what are the actions and behaviors that those boards um, are exhibiting. That helps us make some linkages and connections between the work of the board and student success. We have lots of data on this, and I'm not going to give it all to you today because we want to make sure that we have time for our excellent panel and questions and all of that. But over the course of this year, if you continue to join us for uh, these workshops, for this webinar that we're doing, we'll give you more information. But some of the initial, I want to just give you a little sneak peek, and maybe this is a little bit of a teaser for you being interested in more information. These are the top 10 what we call indicators of, um, of what boards are doing who govern uh, districts with high student achievement. So for example, if you just look at number one, they are in order um, it, from the top number one indicator to the 10th indicator. Um, so for example, the first one is through actions and policies. The, these boards communicate high expectations for all students. Number two is treat all individuals with respect. Number three is foster a culture of collaboration. So you can take a look as you go uh, down through that list. Again, you, you have a copy of this uh, PowerPoint to take a look at, and you can look these up in the uh, board standards. But here's what's really interesting. If you look at that, half of these um, really focus on teamwork and collaboration and having that effective team. So it's it's not incidental that these boards who are working together well and, and um, rowing in the same direction, so to speak, even if there are differences among them, are um, overseeing um, high levels of student success in their district. So there's a there is a significant relationship between those two things. So I've set you up with a little bit of information about why this work is important, um, creating that team and ensuring that you're coming on to the team as a new board member uh, with an understanding of why it's important uh, to, to find ways to work together well. And a couple of people who do this really, really well are joining us today. And so I'm really happy to be joined um, by Sandy Hayes, who is our WASDA president this year and um, also a school director from the North Shore School District. Sandy, what would you like to say about yourself and welcome folks? Well, thank you. I think the most important thing to mention is that both North Shore and Walla Walla School Boards have been boards of the year. And so uh, lots lots of great work happening in both school districts. Um, I'll just say I've been on the North Shore board for uh, I'm in my 15th year now. I've worked with three superintendents and 12 board members. So um, lots of experience in creating new teams. Terrific. Thank you, Sandy. Yes. And and I really appreciate you pointing that out. So you've not only been boards of the year, but um, both districts have been boards of distinction for many years. So a lot of good work has been happening there. And then next, I'm going to give uh, Derek Sarley, was as president-elect, a chance to introduce himself. Derek um, is with the Walla Walla School Board. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. It's nice to meet all of you. I feel like if a picture tells a thousand words, those two headshots so show so much about the respective personalities of Sandy and I on this meeting. I can't wait until you click on to the next slide. But anyway, I'm in my ninth uh, year on the Walla Walla board. Um, have not, I've only worked with one superintendent plus the interim who was there before we hired him, but a whole host of new board members. So not quite as much experience as Sandy, which is a recurring theme. She has a little bit more than me, but um, have kind of been looking forward to, to talking about some of these things for a while. So happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having you. Um, the bad news is that this is your slide, so you have to continue. Oh, no. 
this one. You can you can move um you can move your screen over the top of your picture if you'd like. Um, just also for those of you who are joining us here, just a note that um, uh, North Shore uh, is in uh, Western Washington, is a large school district. Uh, Walla Walla is in Eastern Washington and is considered a medium sized school district. So they represent um, some you know good um, across the state representation. So. We're going to start with the first question, um, which is, you know, considering this research that we just looked at very quickly um, about the impact of collaborative board superintendent teams on student outcomes, can you share how you've seen this in action in your own district or in other districts? Sandy, do you want to start? Okay, I was totally distracted by trying to hide my picture. That, say that. How we have your <laughs> <part then? laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now I'm, I don't have to look at myself anymore. What? <laughs> sorry, say the question. let's 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 run through it. I think it's always good to have a question repeated twice. So, <laughs> so you know, thinking about the the research that we just went through really quickly about what the impact of a collaborative team is mm -hmm. actually on your ultimate goal as a school board, which is student success. Can you share a little bit about how? Um, have you seen this play out within your own district or with other districts around the state? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like I said, three superintendents, 12 board members, a variety of personalities, a variety of people coming at it for different reasons, different places on the political spectrum. Um, and the good news is there, there's no one right version to create an effective team. Um, you don't have to be, you don't even have to like everybody to still be an effective team. And, and as you come into this, you're still getting to know everybody and that's gonna just take some time. Um, the enjoying of working together comes as you've created successes and, and accomplished things. So um, take a breath if right now you're thinking, oh no, I'm not gonna have that effective team because I don't like some of the people or I'm struggling to understand. It, it will come and um, it, it's okay if you're coming at it from different perspectives, that actually is healthy. Um, so, but it's so important to understand each other's why. If you haven't had that conversation as a board yet, as a superintendent board team, that's a great place to start is why have you done this? Even if you're the only one that's brand new and everybody else has been together for 20 years, still hearing that why, because people's why changes over time. Uh, and it's a great place to get that idea uh, that in, in hear that, because um, it may turn out that everybody is worried about math scores. They're just coming at it from different directions and their belief of what's causing the concern with math scores is different. But if you all can come to an agreement of, oh, we all want to work on our students' math scores, we just have different philosophies as to the why, that's okay. We can then put that as our North Star and work towards that. But you, Derek. Uh, that's a couple things I would add. I mean, I would, I would say, first of all, I think, you know, we we had a board member no longer with us uh, who joined our board four years ago, who was explicit in his belief that, that all that WASDA stuff wasn't right. I mean, he would literally say that to the rest of the board. And and I, I think the, the one point I'd want to convey today is that actually everything that's in this presentation and everything else that comes in WASDA leadership development is actually totally aligned with your own self-interest because I got to watch firsthand another board member for four years who didn't really believe in collaboration, who didn't believe in working this way with shared norms, and he was completely ineffective um, for the reason that if you alienate staff and you can't find two other votes for what you want to do, you're not going to accomplish any of the things you want to do. And so um, I think that's a that's kind of an important point that whatever reason you join the board for and whatever you actually want to accomplish, this is the way to accomplish that. Um, and I think a, a, another way of, of looking at that, because we've experienced it a lot the last four years, is that the board itself is only one source of conflict. So take, like, assume that away for a moment, and conflict comes into our schools for a million different reasons, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's all the other stuff that we've seen the last couple of years. And anytime that conflict is pushing on the school system, you see that the school system is less able to move forward in the direction of being the best school system it can be because the board's working on the conflict stuff. The superintendent is working on the conflict stuff and it pulls attention and focus away from your strategic plan and the goals you're actually trying to accomplish. So if it happens when the community or when society as a whole is doing it to you, 
you can sort of see this, it's going to happen when the board's creating the conflict itself too. And so it's so like, it's so important to figure out how to work through that. Conflict's fine if it's constructive conflict, but to work through that so that everybody can actually be pulling in the same direction. And I think, you know, the one um, sort of as you're trying to figure out as you join your board, is this constructive conflict or not? One sort of reliable indicator I've seen over the last few years is when the board is comfortable, and you see it on your own board, you see it on other, on other boards. Um, if the board's comfortable delegating work to committees or to you know, a committee that has a board rep, um, and they, they trust that that work's gonna get done, it's gonna be reported back honestly, um, and not everybody feels like they need to be in every meeting, then, it, then that's a pretty good indicator that, okay, that's a board that's working well together. If everybody feels like I got to be in every meeting because if I'm not there, I don't trust what's going on, then that's a pretty bright, bright line uh, indicator that something's not working well. That's a great segue, um, Derek, into our next question, which is really just that acknowledgement that, you know, school board elections can be, um, they're, they're often competitive and sometimes very divisive as well. So for the two of you, what advice would you give to new school board members for navigating conflict within their new board or board superintendent team? It might be resistance to having them there, or they may have already some relationships with uh, people on that team that may or may not be productive. Um, you know, I really think about, you know, how can we, um, how can we think for new school board members about being respectful of the work that's gone before them? because they're joining a, a board and superintendent and a staff that's already done many, many years of work, but also bring their own interest to the table. What advice would you give to new school board members for how to balance that? Yeah, um, it was interesting. I had a, as I was, I did read the questions ahead of time. Um, I was thinking back and I had only been on my board about six months and it was a pretty dysfunctional board at that time, a lot of conflict um, between board members, a lot of conflict between board and superintendent. And uh, the board president called an emergency meeting, probably not legally, but it's enough, enough in the past that I think we're, I'm okay admitting that. Um, and it, she said, there's a crisis. And that's all I was told. And so at, as you are in those new meetings, you spend a lot of time going, why am I here? What is happening? What am I supposed to be doing in this moment? So I spent most of the meeting trying to figure out what was going on. And I finally, as I really listened, understood that the crisis was is that we weren't getting along. And, um, and I still to this day can't believe I said this, but I finally, I just turned to kind of, it was one board member and one and the superintendent that were really kind of snipping at each other. And I said, okay, let me just stop everybody. And I, so I turned to the board member and said, what I'm hearing from you is that you're frustrated because you do not feel respected or trusted in this work and you are newly elected. And he said, that is that actually is a pretty good summary. And then I turned to the superintendent and said the same thing. I said, what I'm hearing from you is you're frustrated because you don't feel like you're being trusted or respected. And he kind of was taken back that I, said that out loud. And he said, yeah, that actually is true too. And so I, I will share that with you um, at, because I said, all right, look, that's fine. And that's normal for a new team that you, you don't just say trust and respect me. And that's how that happens. It takes time. I said, we are working in the right direction. I'm hearing conversations that lead me to believe that we will get there. Oh, I am loving the guitar that just moved across the screen. That was awesome moment. I hope you've been playing while you've been listening. That's fantastic. Um, but the but the trust and respect will come as you listen and learn from each other. Um, as Tricia pointed out, some of you are in teams that have been together for a long time. Ask the question, has anybody thought about this? Has this ever been tried? How did that work? Um, and, and that's how you earn that trust and respect. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time, but you will get there if you're willing to move in that direction. I, I would just add on as a perfect, uh, that was, that was, this is gonna be a good two-part answer. Um, <laughs> while you're building that trust and respect and while it doesn't exist, that's when the norms are so important because that governs how we interact and deviations from those norms, which then people can say, um, hey, I, I, I'm not sure that was in keeping with the norm we all agreed to and are probably our retreat. Um, either either in a one-on-one -on -one conversation afterwards or in the meeting, if that's where it's taken, hopefully not with a huge audience where it causes a spat. But that sort of 
doing the work within those norms allows us to, to function well when we don't have that trust and respect. And then we'll get there to that trust and respect, but we'll accomplish work in the meantime and we won't, won't make things worse. Um, the other thing I would say is that the um, board relationships and conflict, and this is something that I've learned the last few years, it's not stasis. It, it, it actually, you know, you might have a board member, hypothetically, you might have a board member leave who everybody saw as a source of conflict, but then there's kind of a reorientation that then happens and all of a sudden you have new sources of conflict that were maybe suppressed by the fact that for a while that was sort of the main conflict. So it doesn't, it, it never stays. I mean, new things will happen. You always have to focus on those relationships and that building and the working within norms um, because you don't, you, you don't know, like you, you don't really know what's coming next. Um, and I, I would just say that, you know, one of the big things that um, if, if people see that you're there to do the work and not just to sort of show pony, that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference with how staff use you and it makes a big difference with how your um, fellow board members view you. And so a great thing to ask your board president is, is what do you need from me? Either in sort of general terms, but also on specific issues. You know, I'm, I'm not totally sure. We just, we just put a levy on the ballot. I'm not totally sure what my role is here. I just got here. What do you need from me? What do I, what do I need to do? Is a great way to, for people to understand, okay, you're here to do the work and we can start to rely on you. I love that. Those are great pieces of advice from both of you. I'm going to add on to what Derek said. It's also okay to say, I'm really concerned about this issue. What is my role now as a board member related to that? Um, that's a great question for your board chair and your superintendent to just really, um, because most of you ran for school board for a reason. You, you know, hopefully wanted to make your um, your district be uh, strong and effective and successful for kids, but there are probably some areas that really concern you. And so asking that question, you know, I'd like to learn more about this. What is my role as a board member is a really good one. Um, the other thing that both uh, Sandy and Derek mentioned was about norms. Some of you may be wondering, what are these norms of which they speak? So again, a lot of uh, a lot of board superintendent teams will have some kind of a document. Sometimes it's called a board operating protocol or a board operating procedure or um, a board superintendent um, working relationship agreement. There are a lot of different names for those. So I would ask um, your board chair or your superintendent what um, whether your district has one. Hopefully, if they do, you've already seen it. That would be great if that was part of your orientation. If not, ask. Um, if your district doesn't have one, I think the next question to ask is, what are some of the norms that this team has? What, what are the ways that we operate? What are kind of some agreements that might even just be unspoken that, um, that look at how we work together? So th those will be important as we go through these uh, webinars over the course of the year, we'll probably wrap back and take a look at some board operating protocols. So um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, that, that challenging transition for new board members as they come from being candidates to being school board members. Um, you know, that role really changes because as a candidate, you can say, when I'm elected, I will. But once you're part of a board of five, um, individuals can't take action. And so suddenly that I will, it needs to go um, from the focus on you as an individual to we will, or you know we're working towards this. So it can be a really hard transition as I'm sure you both know um, for new school board members. It can also be really confusing to community members who are wondering, well, you said when you got on the board, you would. So can you give some good advice from, from your perspective on how to help new school board members navigate that challenge? Yeah, thank you. And, and um, that's not the only way that that works. I, my first three times that I ran for office, I was unopposed. And then the fourth time I had an opponent. And so I never had the I campaign until my most recent one. And I drove the people that were helping me with my campaign crazy because they kept saying, well, what have you accomplished? I'm like, I didn't accomplish anything. It's all we, we did this and we did that. And they're like, stop it. You've got to create a website that says I, I, I can't, I cannot do it. I am so used to being, it's a team effort. And it's, it is more than just the five board members. It's the superintendent, it's staff. If things are being accomplished, you're just one little tiny cog in the whole wheel of it getting done. And so 
but that you're right, that's hard. And we've seen board members come onto our board. I've seen them across the state where they come in and they're ready to, they're gonna fix the wiring in the schools. They're gonna get the new math curriculum adopted. They're going to, you know, go storm Olympia and demand funding, right? And so it, you understand that that's where they're coming from. And it just, it's gonna take time. Ask the questions, have you tried this? before. Don't assume that you're the only one in the room that's thought of that idea. Chances are it's been tried and there's a reason that it's not happening. So ask, has anybody thought about doing this? Oh, there's this complication and there's the complication. And I tell every board member, don't be too afraid to say, I do not know. It is a really powerful response um, or ask the question of what does that acronym mean? It is okay to not know everything. I, 14 years on, 15 years on, still ask, I'm sorry, what was that acronym for again? Um, who is this person? What do they do? What does this agency do? That's okay to ask that because the odds are if you're asking that question, most of the people in the room don't know it either. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, it's, I think this is why I enjoy working with Sandy so much. I'm going to give a sort of conceptual version of the same answer, um, which is that it's 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 so much easier to convince people uh, that a problem exists than it is to convince them that you have a solution to a problem that exists. And so that's where you need to start when you're working on a board. You may come in and you say, you have the clearest possible view that something is a problem. Maybe it's student behavior. Maybe it's one of the other things that Sandy mentioned. But you, you have a, probably a very clear view of a problem that exists. Um, but if you come in and you say, there's this problem and I have a solution for it, you are running into a host of entrenched interests. And it is very hard to do that. And so step one is communicating your view of the problem and, understand, and trying to get other people to care about it. Because once everybody cares about it, then they'll start working towards solutions. And there's a really, really good chance that a solution that involves input from a bunch of stakeholders and a bunch of different perspectives, not just yours, is actually gonna end up being a better solution. At the end of the process, you're gonna say that is a better solution and now we'll all move together and everybody has buy into that. Most importantly, the superintendent, because the superintendent hasn't bought into the solution of what of the like how you're gonna do something, it's probably not gonna happen. And so, yes, you said to the you said to the people who voted for you, there's this problem and I'm gonna fix it. But that's what you, where you need to start. And that's what you can communicate to them, that we are talking about that and we are pushing forward on that pro problem, which is step two of this, which is that that problem in solving it needs to be on the agenda of the board. It needs to be on the literal agenda. Like it has to be something that's coming up in meetings because those meetings are organizing principles. Like they actually get staff to start working and conceptualizing and thinking about and bringing to the board for discussion something around the problem that you see. But then it also needs to be on the agenda of the superintendent. And in, in that regard, I mean, it needs to be in their goals. It needs to be in your strategic plan. It needs to be in whatever the board has said, we want you to work on this year, superintendent. Because once the superintendent has understood, okay, this is a problem I need to solve, then that's when action happens. If it's just something that one board member is talking about, then it doesn't happen. So we talk about, we talk about this a lot in negotiations, when we do union negotiations. And it's one of the norms is don't get solution-y. And that's a good way to kind of keep people in line when somebody says like, this is how we need to solve this. Well, let's start with the shared interest here and then we'll get to a solution together. We're not gonna get, get solution-y up front. Uh, Trisha, before you ask the next question, I'm just gonna, again, Derek and I, great team, love working with Derek. I'm gonna really drill down into that buy-in phrase that he used, because that is key. If you think about the average superintendent, they are there three or four years, board members, it's maybe four or five years. Your staff, they're working for you for 20 to 30 years. Families, they live there for a lifetime. Their kids in your system for 13 years. If they do not have buy-in, I guarantee the phrase is, we're just going to ride them out. We're just going to wait till they move on and you are not going to accomplish anything. Buy-in is so key to move the system forward. Excellent points. Um, and, and because you two are both so good at this, you already started answering the, the next question, <laughs> which was that piece around how do you affect change as a, as a new school board member coming in? And Sandy, you just really quantified the challenge right there. So, um, and and Derek, you started really going talking about, you know, bringing other people on board with um, understanding your role. What other 
what other advice to, does either of you have around school board members who are coming on new and they really would like to see some change? Um, I'll probably end up just repeating a lot of what's already been said, but listening, you're really listening for the first six months that you're in this, of uh, what are the problems, who else sees the same problem that I do, and then what are the solutions? Because um, Derek was spot on that your solution is probably the reason it hasn't happened. Is there something in the way of that happening? So figuring out who needs to be at the table, who needs to be part of that conversation, who does, has to buy into that there is a problem that needs to be solved and what are some of the options for solving that problem. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. It, it is gonna, we had a later high school start time. It took 10 years to solve the problem. We have done it, but it was a 10 year project to get our high schools to start later because there are all sorts of components that play a role into what you think, oh, we just start them later. And then, then you uncover all of the myriads of issues that are involved in it. Yeah, I'm gonna give a super ironic answer for me personally because I'm a head guy, I'm not a heart guy. But the number one thing is, is you gotta start by building relationships. Like you, you have to, the other board members need to understand why you're there, what you're trying to do. You need to understand why they're there and what they're trying to do. Because when you understand each other, then you can figure out how to work with people and how to get to that part of like making them care about the same problem that, that, that you care about. And I think, you know, one of the things that you can't just depend on the board, even though in the ideal world, and I will take this as a self-criticism, the board should be doing like a really good job reaching out to new board members and trying to build those relationships. But the reality is we're all super busy. The board's probably, if it hasn't been a lot of change, probably kind of content with the way it's worked together. And we'll get to that eventually. Take it on yourself as a new board member to reach out, to force those relationships, force those conversations. Um, Cause otherwise it might not happen. It might happen. Um, your board might reach out. They might be great at that, but if they're not, go ahead and, and do it. Cause they'll have those conversations, but you're the one who has more of an interest in making it do it. So that's the first one I would say. And then I would say, secondly, when you start talking about issues, um, you know, there's a, there's a chance that the board and the district is kind of in a, in a place on an issue. And maybe we've talked about it a bunch of times, but maybe you see that like we need to be way over here the way we're talking about it, whether that's we need to be more uh, sustainable because of climate change, or we need to do a better job um, uh, teaching our kids because our scores are bad, or we need to do something. I mean, any of those things, it's possible the conversations kind of coalesced here. And you need to figure out how to shift the, the Overton window so that it starts to move over here. And that can happen a lot of different ways. That's much easier to do in a retreat setting where you can say, I've got a crazy idea I want to throw out there. It's a little harder to do when the community is watching you. Or it can be in those one-on-one -on -one meetings you're hopefully having with your superintendent where you just kind of plan an idea of like, have we ever thought about doing this? Again, in a question asking way, as opposed to a directive sort of way. But somehow you've got to move the conversation from where it comfortably sits now into a different way so that people at least start thinking differently and start thinking, well, maybe we should think about it in that direction. And then the last thing is that is, is you have to understand that there's very little chance that you're going to come up with a problem, the solution, and it's going to happen in implementation. We are all so far upstream of any of that stuff. We need to understand that we're going to make a change up here, and it is eventually going to trickle down and make a difference in the classroom here. But if I just try to do this, or if I just try to focus on a computer system we're using or something else, I might get appeased. I might get something, but it's not going to create systemic change up here where the systemic change happens, then it filters down to here and that can take a while and it can feel kind of hands off, but it will, to Sandy's point, move the system long after you may have moved on because they've all started pointing in that direction. Yeah, great. So what I heard from you is um, the importance of listening, really listening to, to um, what has gone on in the past, listening to your other board members, patience, Boy, I can sure attest to that. If, if you um if you have kids in school already and you join the school board to make school better for them, it's you're probably going to make it better for them, but more so even for the next generation because all of that work takes time and patience. Um, investing in building those relationships. Um, and then also acknowledging that a lot of those topics are already on the plates of the board and the board superintendent team. And so figuring out how you can enter those conversations and as Derek suggested, um, find some ways to move it. So, okay, last question for you both. And this is the one that's fun. This this is the one where you really get to um, 
<laughs> share your deepest, darkest secrets or not. <laughs> if you could go back um, to when you were first elected and give yourself some advice based on what you learned since then, what would that advice be? Um, I think I, when I first came on, like I said, it was uh, pretty toxic. It, it ended up, it was one board member and that was really driving, you know, she was an advocate. She wanted to be the hero in every situation. Um, and I learned over time that you can still be an effective board. Um, I think there was a throwing up of hands at the time of, well, we've got this one that doesn't want to play by the rules, doesn't want to be part of the team, therefore we can't do anything. And after a couple of years, we learned, no, you know what, we can still do all the things that Derek and Trish and I have talked about, that systemic change, we can still work towards making things better for our students, even if you have someone that doesn't want to play by the rules or play nicely in the sandbox. It's okay. So I don't want anyone to think of, well, God, but we've got this one person that just came on or has been on forever and they are just always throwing a wrench into things. You can still work as a team. You can still work together and get things done and move forward. Yeah, and I would say, um, I mean, you're, first of all, the, my first point of advice would be, would be what you're doing already right now, which is um, you need sounding boards, you need other people you can talk to. Every, every school district in the Washington state is going through so many of the same issues. And you start to realize when you talk to your cohorts around the state um, that not everybody's trying to solve them the same ways. It's a great way to sanity check. Am I thinking about this the right way? Or a great way to say, oh, wait, you made progress on this year. How did you do it? Or just, I mean, just the only people who understand school board members are other school board members, truly, at the end of the day. Superintendents kind of understand us, but only a little bit. It's your fellow school board members. So I would say building those connect, those cross-district connections, other people that you can talk to is so important. And that obviously comes through WASTA. Um, the, the second thing, and this is sort of a jump from the question, but I think it's really important, is that this you all, this cohort of new school board members is in some, I think, really important ways, the first post-COVID generation of school board members. Mm -hmm. Like everybody else, we went through it. And then if we didn't go through it two years ago, if you got elected, you got elected in the middle of it. Um, and there are scars there. There are things that we all, like that we're, we're tired in some ways, there are things that we all dealt with. Um, and I think this is a, this is a, chance for a fresh energy to come into school boards across Washington State. And the reason I think that matters is, you know, Danny Westneat had a column this weekend talking about the polling that shows Washington State voters don't care about education. Um, people aren't really thinking about it. We're not, we don't really have a motivating story for what education in Washington State is going to be. And in the vacuum that exists, in the absence of that story, a whole lot of other stuff is being said. And so we have got to figure out what our public schools for. We have to define that vision. And I think that energy and that thought and that intellectual heft is going to come from uh, the old heads too, but also this group that is bringing that shot of energy and that, you know, Sandy made a really good point. If the school district isn't doing something, there's probably a reason why. But also sometimes those of us who've been around a long time are too good at saying, we tried that, it didn't work, right? It's the new blood that comes in and says, yeah, but did we try it like this and maybe we should try it again. That's your challenge, that's your opportunity, and that's the huge impact you're going to make on schools and students in Washington State. That is some great advice and and uh, and, and really some um, great um, encouragement for all the school mm -hmm. board members who are here learning. And, and like you said, uh, just the fact that uh, you all are here learning today, that is an outstanding first step. Nobody does a job well without learning how to do it, learning on the job, making sure that they get professional development. And that's what WASD is here for. That's really why we exist in order to do that. So we're, we're thrilled to have you here today. And Sandy and Derek, um, outstanding uh, advice and, and information for our new board members. Thanks so much. Not the last time you'll hear from Sandy and Derek. I'll probably rope them into doing this again. Um, they always Thank have you. just um, wonderful perspectives. So I'm going to run through just a couple things for you as we wrap up. Um, Tricia, the, if uh, yes. Derek uh, gave an opening for us to advertise our regional meetings that will be coming this spring. So be on the lookout for those. He talked about Connecting, that's a great way to start that is go to your regional meetings. There'll be something in your director area coming between March and May. Um, and so be on the lookout for that and you can go to um, 
those and start connecting with people in your area. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. We uh, absolutely, that's one of many things that we'll bring to new school board members and, and school board members, um, and which I'm going to run through just in, in a couple of minutes. But I, I didn't have on my list the regional meetings. So thanks for doing that. It's a great way to, to meet other school board members um, in your area from other school districts. So just a quick challenge for you, um, based on what you've learned today, notice where you see evidence of your board members and superintendent working either as a team or as individuals. And then also pay attention to yourself too. Ask that same question of yourself. Where am I really working with the team or where am I going off on my own and working as an individual? And how can I make some correction to that to make sure that the um, things that I desire and, and the reason I joined the board are going to have some chance of uh, working because I'm going to include the whole team and part of it. And then think again about, you know, what are the outcomes of the uh, that are different in those two different instances? And then lastly, just think about one commitment you'd like to make to yourself that could contribute to a collaborative board superintendent team. So maybe it's like, oh, I really need to focus on listening better. Or, you know, I hadn't thought about making um, connections um, and creating stronger relationships with my other board members. Or maybe it was something else you heard today or that it made you think of. So those are some things to challenge yourself on between now and the next time we meet. And then I'm going to take just a couple quick minutes because we're getting close to our time being over here to walk through a couple of the resources that WASDA has for you. And, I, and in the meantime, um, if you have any questions, please pop those into the chat box. I don't see any in there right now. I wanna make sure that we have time to answer them. So where do you get information? Hopefully all of you have, since you found this webinar, um, had the chance to go to wasda.org. And so you're gonna see a lot of materials there. Um, one of them I'd like to point out, uh, there are really two uh, tabs where you're gonna find a lot of information from the leadership development branch. Um, but I also will put in a plug for the strategic advocacy and the policy and legal branches, which also provide um, just huge numbers of resources and, and tools uh, and support in those different areas. But the leadership development is really about uh, learning professional development for you as a school board member. So if you go to the training and events tab, which I've um, indicated here with the arrow, you will find all of WASDA's um, trainings and events uh, throughout the year. And so that can be really helpful to you. Um, as you really dive down into that, you also can find that um, board boot camp is available. If you are someone who took board boot camp, one of the 225 people who squeezed into that room for five hours for board boot camp, thank you for doing that. Um, if you didn't and you missed it, we also have a, um, a virtual board boot camp. It is Pre recorded, it was recorded just for the virtual version. So you're not looking um, across at a bunch of um, tables full of noisy people. Um, it was filmed specifically for this purpose. It is um, online, on demand. You can go at your own pace. Um, so there's that, that opportunity to do that there if you'd like to. Um, also, then under the leadership, those were both under the training and events tab. Under the leadership development tab, you'll see on um, this page that talks about required training. So there are a couple uh, pieces of required training for school board members. Um, one of them is under um, educational equity. Um, one of them is under open government training. And then the third one is tribal consultation. First two are required for everybody. Tribal consultation is required only for certain districts um, that have a certain uh, percentage of uh, Native American students in their district. Um, but I do wanna speak uh, just really quickly to um, the first two. I think I have this on the next slide. I do, I love that when that happens. Um, the educational equity training um, is required by the legislature. And um, you've, there are a couple of good graphics. Again, um, you can go ahead and go online and look at leadership development slash onboard. Onboard is our professional uh, learning system for school board members that's designed just for those of you who are in Washington. Um, there is a legislative training requirement in educational equity of taking two courses, um, your first two years of service. And these are highly interactive, um, relation-based, relationship-based trainings that we've gotten lots of great feedback on. We're not preaching at you. It's really more of an opportunity to talk and learn from each other about um, your own work in your own district and what others are doing in their districts. 
We also offer some training um, through the onboard model uh, on finance, school finances and budgeting. And um, these are really helpful for those of you who are just starting to try to understand all of those many, many pages full of lots of numbers that you're starting to look at in your board meetings. Um, school finance is very different from personal home finance or even you know just regular business finance. So these are some opportunities for you to take this training. It is not required but it is really helpful for understanding your role related to fiscal responsibility as a school board member. All of these trainings are offered in person at annual con conference every year in November, um, in person regionally at some trainings that we're um, actually organizing right now, getting those set for February, March, and probably April. And then they are also available virtually for an interactive live in person, uh, not in person, live, but there's a, um, a, a facilitator that uh, walks you through all of it. So lots of different ways for you to um, access training and professional development. And you can see a lot of those here on our calendar. So this is just a quick look at some of them. And so I am going to jump into the chat box because I see there might be a couple questions here. Let's see. Do I have some good questions here, Christine? Have you had a chance to look through those? Um, I have, I just saw one question. I think it was uh, regarding the board self-assessment. Okay. And so I responded that if, if any board wants to take that, please feel free to email me or if you have any questions about it and I can send you the link. Perfect. That's great. Also ask your school board, have they taken the board self-assessment? We recommend taking the board self-assessment survey once a year. It's a great way for you to take a little bit of time and think about Where's our school board doing really well? What's our team? Where are some areas where our team would like to grow? So also um, on the WASDA webpage under staff, you can easily find um, email links to Christine or me. Um, and under the board of directors, you'll find them for Sandy and Derek. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or need things. And then um, next... Uh, the next webinar that we're having is February 20th, and we're going to look at elements of school governance. So really diving down deeply into the uh, overview of the board's roles, how to navigate those board meetings, lots of challenges many of us have learned over the years, sometimes the hard way, about um, uh, how to navigate uh, tricky board meetings, uh, public meetings, and then some legal and ethical considerations. And then we're gonna be covering a variety of topics over the course of the year. And if you have some topics you'd really love for us to cover, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but we've got a few of them here. We're gonna be looking at the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, what does effective education advocacy look like? Um, how about engaging your community in an authentic way? Um, what's the value of student voice? And then deciphering some um, student achievement data. So those are really, the things that we have um, on our plate for you for the uh, rest of the year. So I am going to close out. It looks like we are at 1259. So I might be giving you 30 seconds of your life back. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you next month and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Derek and Sandy, thanks so much for joining us today. Okay, have a good rest of the day, everybody.